Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? Good, fine, thumbs up. Okay. Seems reasonable. You're not an angry crowd, then. <laughs> no, good. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I started working with some of the features that were being defined for what was at that time ES6, but what we came to know as ECMAScript 2015. These new features of JavaScript, I started working with them actually in early 2014, around January of 2014, because I was very excited about these changes to the JavaScript language. And the beautiful thing was, if you were using a transpiler tool, like back at that time there was Tracer, and there was, I forget what Babel was called before Babel right at the moment, but when you compiled your code from ECMAScript 2015, this new syntax into regular ES5 code, you could run it in any browser. So I saw a lot of advantages of trying to get ahead of the curve and trying to use these new features of JavaScript because some of them are quite wonderful. But then I realized over the course of the next last couple of years that there are consistently areas that where people run into problems with these new features. So in the old days, cartographers used to come up with maps that would try to describe the world and they would occasionally place these mythical sea creatures and beasts that look angry like they're gonna eat someone. They would place those in the areas of the map that were either unexplored or known to be dangerous because there are rocks in the water and so forth. So my goal is to give you a map of some of these ECMAScript 2015 features and talk about where you need to be careful and just some things to be aware of, tips and tricks and things not to do. Which, it's actually amazing with these new features how many areas that look so simple that create problems in projects or behaviors that you don't understand. For example, we'll, we'll first talk about arrow functions, which I thought were very simple. And it turns out I've seen more people run into unexpected behavior with arrow functions than anything else. So for those of you that aren't familiar with some of the ECMAScript 2015 features, I'll just do a brief review of each one that I talk about. So arrow syntax in ECMAScript 2015 is very similar to the Lambda syntax in C Sharp for .NET developers. I can create a function definition where a parameter x, that was not the expected behavior. <laughs> One second. Have to remember how to use my keyboard. There we go. And now if I hit this key, that's not what I wanted. Let me try, well, let me just try to use the mouse. The, I'm trying to use a little red marker, but it's not behaving well. This function, this is a function definition, square. I'm, so I'm, I'm assigning a function definition to a variable square. It's a function where it takes one parameter x and that goes to the expression x times x. So just like in C sharp, you don't need curly braces, you don't need a return statement, um, and of course it's JavaScript, so you don't need types, but I now have a function that I can invoke and pass in the number three and it will return to me nine. And here's a function definition that takes two parameters. So just like in C Sharp, if you have more than one parameter or if you have zero parameters, the parentheses are required around the function signature. So two parameters, x and y, they go to the expression x plus y. I can pass in two numbers and get a result. So it looks simple, it seems simple. There's a couple things to be aware of with this syntax though. It's wonderful in JavaScript because JavaScript is basically a functional programming language. We have to write a lot of functions. Functions are basically our one unit of abstraction that we can use in JavaScript, and there's a lot of higher order functions in JavaScript. So if you look at the array, one of the built-in APIs now is a mapping function that I can pass in another function that will be used to evaluate and produce a new array. It will be used against each element in the array. So this is doubling one, two, and three to turn it into an array of two, four, and six. And it's nice that I can just write a lambda expression there instead of typing out the function keyword and so forth. But what sort of things can go wrong? So let's start with a simple one. What if I want to take that mapping function and return an object literal? So for these values one, two, and three, what I'm trying to do is produce an array that says value one, value two, value three. But this doesn't work. So the curly braces are not required in an arrow function. Just like in C Sharp, if you just have an expression that you want evaluated and returned, you don't have to use the curlies. But as soon as you do use the curlies, the JavaScript interpreter this doesn't see this as an object literal, it sees it as now a block of code that has to be executed and has to have an explicit return statement in order to produce something from that function. So what I'm really doing is I'm saying, for each value in, in the array, pass it in as n and execute this code value n and just throw it away. And you might say, well what, you know, what is value colon n? 
how does that even work in JavaScript? Well, it turns out JavaScript has labels. So what the JavaScript interpreter or runtime sees is you have a label called value, and it points to this thing that just uses n. So anyway, end result there is I get back undefined, undefined, undefined. To do that properly, one way to do it would be to add an explicit return statement and say return value colon n, or I can just wrap my expression in parentheses, and that will produce the expected result, value 1, value 2, value 3. Very good. What else can go wrong? Well, it turns out one of the problems they tried to solve in ECMAScript 2015 is the slippery this pointer in JavaScript. If you've been doing JavaScript for any length of time, then you probably know that the this, the this reference can change on you when you have a callback function that gets invoked from a different context. So quite often when we use something like set timeout in JavaScript, and we expect that the callback function when the timer expires to have a this reference that still points to our same <laughs> object, uh, quite often it'll, well, it will point to the window object in the callback because set timeout is invoking that function from a different context than where we originally called set timeout. So that would be a problem, for example, in this bit of code where I say numbers dot for each, call this function for each n, and try to get to this dot sum. What I'll get as a result of this expression is cannot read property sum because the this reference is not pointing to my adder anymore. So in ECMAScript 2015, they tried to help with this behavior by saying, when you write this as an error function, what an error function will do is lexically capture the value of this for you. So you don't have to write uh, var self equals this or var me equals this or any of those patterns that you've probably seen in the past where people capture the this reference and form a closure around it so that it's saved somewhere in a different variable. Instead, what the JavaScript runtime will do for this arrow function, arrow functions will always have a this reference that is lexically the same as the outer scope. So if I'm inside of a method called add, and I invoked add through the adder, so that would pass in that adder object as the this reference, I'm guaranteed that the this reference here will be the same as the this reference just above that line of code, right? Which is nice, still makes me nervous when I see this inside of a callback function, but it works, always works. But because of that, there's a couple things to be aware of with arrow functions. Arrow functions are not a replacement for a regular function. There's a couple rules about arrow functions. They behave differently than regular functions because of this. So one of the implications of that is that, uh, first of all, you can have too many arrow functions. So the difference between the code that we see, or sorry, this is the code that works. This is a function definition inside of an object literal. I don't need the function keyword there, but that's not an arrow function. The arrow function's still inside of here. This will still reference my adder object, and this will still be the same as it is outside of that. But if I write it this way, where I place add as a method on my adder using an arrow function definition, well, again, that arrow function captures the this reference that is in, in scope lexically outside of this definition, which would be the line right above adder, which might be your, if you're inside of a module, the this reference will be null uh, or undefined. If you're in an ES5 file, the this reference would go back to being the window. So that's a little bit of a problem. You have to be careful about what context, what lexical context you're actually picking up. And then the other big one is this code. So what I'm trying to do is define a method or define an object called adder it has no behavior on it net yet, there's no methods on it, but I want to dynamically place some behavior into this. So what I'm gonna do is define a function called add using an arrow function, and then I'm going to talk, call, uh, tell JavaScript that I want to bind adder to add. So the bind method, if you've never used it, is quite useful. It, it's a way of saying, when someone invokes this, add, I'm going to bind it to adder so that the, this reference can always be set up to point to this object but bind does not work on arrow functions. That's the important thing to understand. When the JavaScript runtime encounters this arrow function, it permanently bakes the value of this into the arrow function. So the value of this right here inside this arrow function will always, 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 always be whatever this was right here in the, that space, which could be null, could be window, could be anything. And there's, there's just no possible way to change that value. You cannot use bind to change that value. You couldn't invoke the function, an arrow function with apply, 
for example, and change the value of this like you could with other functions. And that has a number of serious implications. I see this a lot in React code where React programmers will commonly um, use function.bind to try to take a, a method that will handle a click event and bind it to a component. And then they'll try to define that method or function using an arrow function, it just, it just does not work. It also just introduces sometimes subtle bugs. So if you've ever used the Jasmine unit testing suite for JavaScript, you might know that the way I can set up a tech test context that I, where I can share stuff between like setup code and the test inside of a unit test here, is just to attach things to the this reference. So outside of here, I could say something like this dot test suite name equals foo. And then I would expect inside of here to say this dot test suite whatever is, and get that value, but it doesn't work with error functions. When Jasmine invokes this callback function to execute my test, it tries to set the value of the this reference to the current test context, but it fails because you can't do that with error functions. Here's another example. I'm gonna be fancy and try using jQuery to say when the button is clicked, then I want to change the name of the button to clicked. So if I would do that as a regular function definition, this would work because when jQuery invokes your event handling callback, it sets up the this reference to point to the thing where the event originated, like the button. Unfortunately, with an error function, the value of this will be whatever's out here, right? Lexically in scope. And jQuery cannot change that, therefore I'm probably setting the name of the window object instead of the name of the button. Making any sense? All right, I'll keep going then. I had a ginger shot right before this session, which might have not been the best idea because I feel a little jumpy right now. <laughs> so arrow functions are entirely different. They essentially, there's no way to change the this reference and they're not normal functions. For one thing, they have no implicit arguments variable. You know, typically in JavaScript, when you invoke a function, you can look at arguments, and it looks like an array of everything that was passed in, but no, not with error functions. This arguments will be, if you're inside of another function, would be the arguments from the outer function. So there's no implicit arguments. Evaluating that code would say result.length is zero. So that's arrow functions. Let's talk about template literals. Another extremely useful feature in ECMAScript 2015. What a template allows me to do is to say, basically string interpolation. So it's like the dollar sign, double quotes, and C-sharp six that were introduced. I want to have a string where I produce a string like three plus five equals eight. So I can poke variables into my string. I can evaluate expressions into a string. And of course, those are back ticks not single quotes, not double quotes. You have to use a, have a back tick to have a template. But when people see the word template, they think, oh, I can define a template and then reuse it in different areas of my application. Unfortunately, that's not how they work in JavaScript. In fact, in one of the earlier specifications for ECMAScript 2015, they called these quasi-templates, like pseudo-real templates. <laughs> Because the way they behave is when the JavaScript interpreter hits this template, X and Y have to be in scope. They have to be defined, they have to be available. So it's not like I can find this template and pass it to someone else who has an X and a Y. No, the X and a Y, everything is evaluated right there in place. But you can make them reusable. For example, if I have something called template that is an arrow function, so now it's a function definition, takes two parameters, X and Y, well, now anyone can reuse that template. I can say template two and two, template six and two, and I'll get back the expected output, like two plus two equals four. So that's good. The other thing you can do, if you're familiar with the destructuring syntax in ECMAScript 2015, is I could even pass in objects here. So I'm defining a template that takes an object that has to have X and Y properties. Um, the curly braces here mean I'm destructuring or or ripping out properties out of that object, I'm ripping out the X value, ripping out the Y value, putting them into individual variable declarations, and now someone can invoke my template and pass in a, a model object. So here's my model object for a point, it has a two and a two, so I'll get out two plus two equals four. Crazy syntax. <laughs> JavaScript has always had some crazy syntax. So that destructuring syntax is actually very interesting, but uh, I've seen a couple places where it becomes dangerous. So there's object destructuring and there's array destructuring um, and there's some additional destructuring that's coming in the future. But square brackets on the right hand side of an assignment, that is constructing an object, right? So we're creating an object literal here with two values, 22 and 44. 
Square brackets on the left-hand side of an assignment, that's destructuring. So this line of code is creating two new variables that are const, x and y. And the way JavaScript will work is to say, oh, you have this array, I'm gonna pull out the first value, put it into x, I'll pull out the second value, put it into 44. Thus, this unit test would pass. X would be 22, Y would be 44, very good. And you can also have object destructuring. So curly braces on the right hand of an assignment, that's constructing an object. Curly braces on the left hand side, that's destructuring an object. So I'm creating a new variable called state. The default value will be New York. In other words, if the object I'm destructuring from doesn't have a state property, this will get the value New York and country would be USA. In this case, state would be Maryland, country would be USA, there was no country in the address. That all seems fine and simple when you, once you understand destructuring and you look at simple expressions like that. Unfortunately, you can do crazy things. So here's a more complicated object employee. It has first name, has a nested object address, it has an array of favorite numbers. This bit of code here is saying, create a new variable first name by destructuring out the first name of that employee. Okay, so fine, that'll be Scott. Uh, create a variable state. So we're not creating a variable address, we're creating a variable state that will be destructured by going to address.state on that object. Destructure a variable called favorite numbers that will go into the array and pick out the second value that's in the array, 55. So that's all destructured out of employee, I'll now have first name equals Scott, state equals Marilyn, favorite numbers, 55. That's a little bit weird. And you can do things like this. <laughs> what is the value there? Well, we, we are creating a new variable length that will be destructured from the string, so what dot length would be four, right? That looks a little bit weird, but it gets better. I mean, I think this is hard to read. That's just weird, but it gets better. So you're familiar with the bang, bang, you're a Boolean type coercion in JavaScript, where you use two exclamation points. This is a way of saying, I need to know the truth, the, I need to know if value should be considered as true or false. Uh, so I'm not, what I'm going to do is apply the negation operator, which in this case would return false, and then I'll apply the negation operator again to turn that false into a true, but what I get into the result is a true Boolean. So bang, bang, you're a Boolean. I wanna know if you're true or false. That's weird, but we can combine that with other syntax like destructuring to do better things. Oh, actually, so th not destructuring. This is the um, spread syntax. So dot, dot, dot is a new feature of ECMAScript 2015 where I can take an array and I can spread it into another array, or actually I can also use it when I invoke a function to spread parameters across the individual parameters of a function. But the result of this expression is an array one, two, three, four, five, six. So it spreads those values out into the array. So let's combine bang, bang, you're a Boolean with spreading and a new feature that's in, um, coming up in ECMAScript, I think it's in the 2017 specification, which is an object spread, which is ex actually extremely useful. What I want to do is I want to build a result from an object literal expression. I want result to have a name, which will be a string, whatever. And I want to take this data object and spread it into that object as if it's a, so it's a part of the object. I don't wanna say result.data, I wanna say result.x. And that's exactly what that dot, dot, dot syntax will do. Take the properties out of data, pluck them out, put them into this other object. Extremely useful, right? There's a lot of um, places like in React where you're always copying little pieces of state around, so that'll be very useful. So what does this do? So this is, this is where we, <laughs> this is in the Redux library. And you look at this expression, dot, 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 bang, bang, data, and it takes a second. <laughs> but the important part to understand here is that the, the operator precedence that JavaScript will apply will first do bang bang data to get a Boolean value. So basically, I wanna know if data is there or not there. I wanna know if it's true or false. So if it's true, now we have this ternary expression. Um, that will be evaluated next. So let's say data is true. In that case, I will take data. If data is false, I will take this object literal default true. And then the last operator to be applied because it's the lowest precedence is this object spread operator. So basically I'm building a result that if I have data, will contain the data. But if it does not have data, it will have just name and um, default true, right? So it's a neat little syntax, but the first time you encounter it, you have to go do some research with it. <laughs> 
Let's talk about cons. I've already been using it because a lot of people say, never use var anymore, never use let, always use const unless you really do have to reassign to a, a variable declaration. So what does const do? Well, if I create a const x equals two and then I try to assign to x, I should have a type error at runtime, assignment to constant variable. I shouldn't be allowed to change the value that is inside that variable. But it doesn't mean that I cannot change something that that variable references or points to. So if I have an array that is const, I cannot change the reference in that variable, but I can certainly still change the array. So I could push and pop and slice and do whatever I want to it. If I really wanted to make that array immutable, there's an object.freeze API where I could say let's freeze the array and then trying to push into it, that would be a type error. Let's talk about collections for a second. There's new collections and new collection APIs in ECMAScript 2015. Uh, one best practice that is suggested now is never try to create, so, so I wanna create an array. Typically I just use an object literal. But let's say I'm in a more dynamic piece of code that is trying to be uh, very dynamic. We, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what parameters are, that people are gonna pass to me, but I just know that what they give me I have to turn into an array. So one way to do that is to invoke the array method, pass in values that will produce an array. That's good. Unfortunately, if you invoke array with just a single parameter though, <laughs> array assumes that, oh, you want an array of this size and I'll just fill in undefined. You know? So this one produces an array. This one produces an array of 10 things that are undefined. It, so there's this incongruity in the behavior of array. The suggestion as of ECMAScript 2015 is to always use of. If you expect to take a value and produce an array out of it, just use array.of, pass in however many parameters, they will always be an array. And there's also array.from, which inter interestingly enough will work with anything that has a length property. So I can, I can say array.from, uh, I'm gonna pass in an object that has a length property set to five, and this is a little callback function that'll always just take a value, um, and the key that is used, and we're just gonna write out the key value so I get one, two, zero, one, two, three, four from that expression. That's the key values as it iterates through that. There's also a set. There's set and map in ECMAScript 2015. They're quite useful in a number of scenarios, but they are shallow. In other words, if I create a new set and add the same, try to add the same value twice, the set size will just be one because it will not accept the second nine. It won't throw an error, just you know, won't add anything to the set, nine's already in the set. But if I try to pass in two arrays that contain the values nine, um, you might hope that it's smart enough to realize they contain the same values, but it doesn't do that. All it sees is two different object references, two different references coming in, so the size will be two there. And, but of course, if I do try to add the same reference twice, so array, is pointing to this that was created from an array literal. That would be a set size of one. Another common question is, we have this, these new collections, map and set, they're quite useful in a number of scenarios, and we can create arrays using object literal syntax, we can create objects using object literal syntax. Is there, an, is there an, a, a literal notation for map and set? No, the way you would create a new map or a new set is to invoke the constructor and with map, the constructor's a little bit weird, but you basically pass in an array, an array of arrays, right? So the first element here would be mapping one to the string representation of one, and two to the string representation of two would be the second element in that map. Classes. So the big thing, right? We, when I explain ECMAScript 2015 classes, and same thing goes for TypeScript too, I, I always explain them, you know, these are really just syntactic sugar for what some people used to do in JavaScript, which is the code here on the right. When the JavaScript runtime, or even when a transpiler runs across this, this employee class, you could implement the same thing just by first defining a constructor function that takes a name and assigns name internally as a field to that object, and then set up the prototype object on that constructor function to have the methods or the shared behavior that you want. And it's true, the code over here and the code over here would function pretty much identically. I can say new employee, pass in Scott, and then invoke do work on that employee, they both do the same thing. But there are some subtle differences that 
it's always those little things that people run into on certain projects. So, for example, hoisting. If I do, if I, if, if, well, in JavaScript, you might be familiar with this term, hoisting. It, it, hoisting happens on var declarations and func function declarations. It's basically the JavaScript runtime looking through my file and saying, oh, I see you have a function declaration down here. I'm going to hoist that up so essentially that symbol, like employee, is at the top of the file. And that means I can write code like this. I'm going to create a new employee, so I'm going to say const D equals new employee, and this code will work even though the function is defined later in the file. You know, maybe it's a utility function or it's a class that I don't really want to think about it. I'm going to push it down beneath the, the code that does some real work, and that's fine. That does not happen with classes. If I try to instantiate a new employee, and employee was a class definition, that'll be a runtime reference error. So your class definitions have to come and appear lexically before you try to use them. And the interesting thing is that class is actually hoisted. This is just a weird thing in the JavaScript specifications. They actually say, sorry, let me go back a second. They actually say this employee symbol, it is actually hoisted so that the definition is actually available up here. But for class definitions, let variables, and const variables, the ECMAScript specification describes this thing called the temporal dead zone. Anyone ever hear that term? I love that term, temporal dead zone. <laughs> Sounds scary. The temporal dead zone is what they define as the area where uh, above the place where something was defined. So if I say let x equals 2 here in the middle of the function, yes, x is hoisted to the top, but it is inside of its temporal dead zone. And if I try to do anything with that symbol x, I should get a reference error. So if I try to assign to it, if I try to read it, even if I try to use type of on that variable, it'll throw a reference error, er, error. it's in the TDZ. And that goes for const, and that goes for classes also. Here's another difference. If I define, so this is a constructor function, human equals function, and then uh, modifying the prototype, human.prototype.do work as a function. So that's the old way of defining a class or a type in JavaScript. I can use a for in loop to go through a new instance of that human object and look at all the things that are available that I can index into, and I will get out the value do work. If you do the same thing with a class, which is to define a class, have a do work method, try to iterate through it for in, that'll produce an empty array. I cannot get to the, the method definitions that are on an object, using a for in, at least. If you do want to write code like that, you can write code something like this. So I'll instantiate a new horse and invoke object.getprototype of. And then I will use a for of loop. Uh, we could talk about that too today. But for of is pretty simple to understand. It iterates the values inside of something instead of the keys that are in something. I will iterate through object.get own property names for the prototype object of that, and that will actually give me back the methods that are available, and that will actually include the constructor too. So even if I don't have an, a, a constructor defined, it's kind of like C sharp, where if you have no constructor defined, you get the default constructor. Same thing in JavaScript. I'll have a constructor, and I'll have a method called do work. New is required. So we used to do this thing in the old days of JavaScript where we'd write a constructor function and then we would write defensive code to make sure that someone invoked that constructor function using the new keyword. That was something you could check by using like the instance of operator to make sure the instance of this uh, was the same as your constructor function. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, we used to do that, by the way, because if someone invoked a constructor function without using the new keyword, the this reference would be set up to be like the window object, global variable, and so everything that happened inside the constructor would be creating new variable, global variables, which is bad. Don't have to worry about that with uh, classes. If someone tries to invoke basically the constructor function for, for this class definition, there will be a type error. You have to use new. But this being JavaScript, <laughs> You can actually implement a constructor function that does not return a horse. You can return anything you want. It's JavaScript, right? So I can have a constructor function that returns some object with the name of Jiffy. That's legal. Yes. Shake your heads. 
Let's talk about modules. So when I first started reading about modules in ECMAScript 2015, I was so excited. I thought, finally, this language will have something that has been needed since the beginning of time, a, a feature that every serious programming language has to have. I mean, without modules, you just can't scale up in complexity. And then after a couple years of working with them, I'm reminded of this quote from an Oscar Wilde play, when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. <laughs> so yes, I have modules now, but there's times when I find them a little bit frustrating. So just to review modules, in the old days of JavaScript, we try very hard to constrain the scope of the things that we're creating, the variables we're creating, the function definitions. And you know, if you just open up a JS file that gets loaded into the browser and you just start writing a function definition, uh, it's very easy to create a global variable in the window object. So after a while, people started following this pattern of using an iffy, immediately evaluated, uh, immediately invoked function expression, because everything in JavaScript can be f scoped to a function. And now anything that I do inside of here, any code that I place, will be local to that function. But I can choose what I want to expose by returning an object or explicitly attaching something to the window object. And then when ES 5.1 was introduced, whoops, sorry, we got, or ES 5 was introduced, we also started adding use strict on this to place the JavaScript interpreter into strict mode, which would uh, allow it to perform a little, little bit better and also help us avoid some common mistakes. However, uh, with ECMAScript 2015 modules, all of this goes away. When I write a .js file that is going to be transpiled by something like uh, Webpack, or well, not Webpack, by Babel, or the TypeScript compiler even, and I'm using things like import and export in that file, it's assumed that I am writing a module. So I don't think about it, I don't think about it as a file anymore. And anything I do in that module is going to be implicitly scoped to that module. It's not gonna be available outside of it at all. I have to explicitly export something like this to make it available from outside of this file. So if I don't export work, it doesn't have to be in an iffy or anything else. It's private to this module, the file that I'm working in. Also, use strict is no longer required with ECMAScript 2015 when you're writing code in a module, it's just assumed to be in strict mode. So you never have to use that strange object, object literal again. Anyway, the export syntax in ECMAScript 2015, I can export uh, multiple objects, I can put my exports down here, I could have also written export, use the keyword right in front of the class definition to say export class person. I can have uh, aliases, so I could do something like export work as foo, comma person, so I could change the name of this when I exposed it publicly. There's also the concept of a default export, which is a little bit confusing, uh, because the way you import a default export uses a different syntax than the way you would import these other two pieces that were exported as, not as defaults, but as symbols. But we'll talk about that. <clears throat> and there's also this syntax, which is quite useful. And this has been a, been around for a while and Angular 2 uses this quite a bit. I think they call it uh, barrel rollups. But basically when I'm, when I'm building a JavaScript application now using modules, I might have a, uh, a folder in my file system that contains a bunch of stuff that has to work together to do something. So let's say it wraps a, an API on my server and I have things in there to make HTTP calls and I have things in there to do special serializations and add auth tokens and all that stuff. So there's a lot of implementation details in there. Someone who, who is consuming that stuff, who is importing some things from there, I don't necessarily want them to know about specific files that are in that folder or specific capabilities. I, so let's say all this is, is, is in a folder called services. What I want them to be able to do is say import something from services and just reference that folder, which is easy to do with most tools if you just provide an index.js file that exports just the things that you want from inside of that collection of things. Hopefully I'm making sense with this. The index.js file could, could look something like this. If I just wanted to export everything from this other file called creatures, I can do it that way, export everything from humans, or I could selectively export things. And by the way, in ECMAScript 2015, you don't specify a file extension here, but implicitly this would be creatures.js. That's what we would go looking for there. Unless creatures is also a folder that has an index file inside of it, then we could get the, uh, exports from everything that is exported from that index.js. 
anyway, imports. So I'm going to import things. So I'm importing person and animal from lib. So ba just backing up a second, um, pretend I have an export like this. It looks like destructuring syntax, but never, ever, ever consider this to be destructuring syntax. I'll talk about this in a minute. We are not creating new variables called person and animal. We're doing something very similar, but I'll talk about the difference here in just a bit, and that's a big point of confusion with modules. So I want to import person and animal. Presumably, they were exported from this module as person and animal. This syntax, without the curly braces, that is asking for the default export from this module. So un unless this module has a line of code that says export default something, um, I will not get anything here for human person. And that's important. And it's not like it throws a runtime error, you just get a, a null value there. I can also import things by importing everything sort of into this namespace. So I could say import everything from uh, React. And then this becomes a almost like a namespace to get to the things inside of that module. I would say lib.foo or lib.bar or lib.animal to, to get to the individual things that were exported from there. Is that making some sense? So let's talk about, sorry, back up one second. Let's talk about what these are. It's not destructuring. It's not like this thing exposes a, model ob, uh, a module object and I'm destructuring things out of the exports. No, what I'm creating is what's known as an immutable binding. So yes, it is like a variable, but behind the scenes for people that have done things like C++, it's almost like a pointer to a pointer. So let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say I write a module where I export a simple variable counter, because you can export all sorts of different things in JavaScript. Export variables, export functions, export object literals, export class definitions. So this is just exporting a simple variable counter equals zero. It's not const, it can be reassigned to. So that means I can also export a function increment where if someone invokes that, I can say counter plus equals one and return the new value. Seems good. Now over here in some other code, let's try to import counter from libcreatures. So yes, it's like I have a variable named counter, uh, but it's immutable. So it's almost like it was defined with const. If I try to modify that, it's not like local to my module, uh, I'll get a syntax error, trying to change the value that is in that module variable, in that binding, sorry. But I can import both counter and increment from creatures. And this is just proving that these bindings are live. So you might think, back, I'm backing up a second, if I get a simple primitive value like a number into a variable, I probably got a copy of it from that module, right? That's what I, would, that's what I thought at first. If I import this simple variable value from another module, well, if it started off as a nine, the other thing could change to a 10, I wouldn't know. But that's not how these bindings work. They're a little bit magical. That's why I say they're like a pointer to a pointer or a reference to a reference. If I import counter and increment from this other module and I invoke increment, well, this code inside the module is allowed to change counter. Inside this module, let, uh, the counter is just a simple variable. So we can change it inside of here. And what I will see from the other module is I will see that new value of counter, which to me was amazing when I realized this. So it's almost like I can have a singleton here defined in my module, and when I make changes to it, the entire application sees the changes in that. Making some sense? And the bindings are live. So let's take another example. I'm going to export an object literal creature. This object has a name of Oscar. I'm going to export a function inspect, just so I can look at the creature's name. And I'm going to export a function reset, which will just give me a new object creature.name equals Oscar. So let's do a few things with that. Um, let's say I import creature from this module and I say creature.name equals Winnie. That's legal. I'm not trying to change. So if I did import creature from this module, creature <coughs> is the binding and I'm not modifying the binding. I'm modifying something that the binding points to. So from outside the module, I can still change the name of the creature and I see the change. And if I call into that module, it sees the change too. So these live bindings work both ways. It truly is like a singleton object that gets exported. And I can reset it and see that change from the outside world too. What is the default value of this inside of a module? It's not the window object anymore. 
It is undefined. So when you're inside one of these files writing import and export statements and you refer to this, you'll get an, un we'll get an undefined until you get like inside of a class definition. Why do I not like modules? Sometimes they feel like a lot of bookkeeping. <laughs> um, this particular code snippet was taken from the, some unit tests from the Angular 2 source code. And I don't know if it's visible from the back, but those, these, these are import statements that stretch for 30 lines of code before we even get to the unit tests. So you open up this file and we're importing so many things, we can't even see the tests that we want to modify or look for what's broken uh, because of all the import noise that's in here. The other thing to be aware of is ECMAScript, the standards committee was very purposeful when they designed this import-export syntax and it has irritated a lot of people. So when they defined this syntax, they wanted to start pushing JavaScript a little more towards being a dependable language that you can analyze with static tools. And when they designed the import-import syntax, they provided no mechanism to do things like Mm, I'm going to determine what module I import at runtime by passing in a string or evaluating an argument. So if you've ever done any Node.js programming or programming outside the browser, um, you might know like the co with CommonJS, the way to import something is to require it, and require is very dynamic. I can actually have code and say I'm going to go through the file system and search for files and just require everything in the subdirectory. There's no possible way to do that with import and export. Reason being, again, they wanted to make this a toolable, they, they wanted this syntax to be toolable and to be able to analyze things in a static manner. So in other words, when a tool like Webpack comes along to build your code into a bundle, it can look at the top of the file and say, oh, I see you're importing foo from bar, importing creature from library, and I know exactly what your dependencies are, and I know I have to go out and grab these other modules and put them together in order to be able to run the code inside of your module. And it can do that with static analysis and without executing any code. Um, whereas something like the require syntax, how do I know what this is requiring? Well, I pretty much have to execute the code at runtime in the correct environment to know anything about what's going on. So the benefits of this static syntax are that you can build tools that do amazing things. They can analyze an entire dependency tree. They can tell you what you're using, what you're not using, uh, what could be thrown away potentially because it's not actually being imported and consumed by anyone. And that's really nice, but there are some times when we want some flexibility. And I will tell you that they are currently working on a proposal for an import function which, which would provide dy dynamic capabilities. So it's an import function, not like the import keyword here. Uh, had to go back too many slides for import. Well, there's an import here. So instead of being a syntax where I say import, like that, it would be an import function, so parentheses, and I could pass in an, ex an expression. But that's uh, very early on right now. It would give me the ability to do some dynamic imports. And of course, the biggest stumbling block with modules and what makes this new world so painful is that modules don't work in the browser. So we're in this weird position where the ECMAScript 2015 standard has been finished, it's been sealed. So this import and export syntax, it's with us, it's not gonna change. We're on firm footing, uh, we're on solid ground when we use import and export. But they <coughs> purposefully didn't define how browsers should behave, or forget browsers, any JavaScript runtime environment, they haven't defined how a, a JavaScript runtime should use import and export. They only define the syntax. So that's put, that puts us in this weird situation where we can use the syntax, but we have to transpile it or change it into a syntax that a runtime will actually understand. <laughs> and that's why when you're using Angular 2 or you're using um, Aurelia or any of these next generation frameworks that rely on things like modules, you have to use a tool like Webpack or Rollup that understand import and export and can convert it into a syntax that a browser will actually work with. Or at a runtime that the browser will actually work with. And that's where things kind of get crazy. So for a long time, I was using a tool, System.js. Anyone using System.js? Aurelia was originally built to use System.js. The nice thing about System.js is that when I first found this repository, I thought this is the thing I want to use because what System.js said is that 
we're going to try to be as close to the specification on how things should behave as possible. So there is, there is a specification out there that says, here's how imports and exports are going to work in the browser, and that's what System.js tries to follow. And it works, and it's good. Unfortunately, that specification you know, keeps changing, <laughs> and System.js will update to match the specification. So using System.js on a production application can sometimes be frustrating, because you uh, NPM install the latest version of System.js, and suddenly nothing works. The other problem with System.js is it can be, unless you pre-build stuff using other tools, it can be a little bit slower than using some of the other tools because it's actually trying to well, uh, import things dynamically for you behind the scenes. That, that one's easy to avoid. Uh, but the one interesting problem we did run, run into with System.js once was it makes heavy use of promises. And the native promise implementation in some browsers from Microsoft <laughs> isn't that good. And uh, it was amazing because just loading up an application would take um, 300 milliseconds in Chrome, and it would take three seconds in a certain browser from a large company. <laughs> anyway, that was fixed, by the way, in that browser, so that's okay. The tool I use most often is Webpack. Webpack, in a way, is a very simple tool. Its sole purpose in life is to analyze dependencies, JavaScript, CSS, whatever you have, and to package stuff up into a bundle, into a single file or multiple files if you want it, something that can be pushed down to the web browser. It doesn't do transpilation, but you can add a plugin to it to, to transpile using Babel or using TypeScript. <clears throat> it doesn't understand how to minify JavaScript, but you can add a plugin for that. It doesn't understand how to uh, read in an HTML file and embed it in your JavaScript so you don't have a, an extra template file to, to include over HTTP. It doesn't understand any of those things, but there's plugins for almost everything. So at the end of the day, Webpack can do just about do everything but cook lunch through, the, through a series of plugins. I like Webpack. Uh, a simple configuration would look like this. So I give Webpack an entry point. The entry point would be the thing typically that bootstraps my application, or the thing that is the, you know, the first bit of code that I need invoked on a page. And Webpack will look at that file, entry.js or entry.ts, whatever you have, and it'll say, what are the import statements? That is, what does this file depend on? And it will follow them. And it'll find other JS files that have imports, and it'll follow those. So you know, if entry.js imports something from Angular 2, the end result would be Webpack would understand that you're using all, of this, all these pieces in Angular 2 and bring all that code in and place it into an output. So in this case, I went a single output with the file name of bundle.js in this directory. And just all that JavaScript code would be included and placed into the file and everything works perfectly. There's no import or export statements inside of it. It's all code that the browser would understand. So Webpack is, again, just one of the tools that can do this. There's another one called Rollup Roll Up that I evaluated just a few weeks ago, but for me, it just wasn't the right tool. Um, the criticism with Webpack, at least before 2.0, was that the code the way it bundled things, maybe the, the code could be a little bit smaller if they did some more optimizations. And I haven't tried 2.0 just yet. It was released last month, and I haven't wanted to try to upgrade any things just yet. Might try it in a couple weeks. Uh, they should have improved on that. And the other thing you'll typically see with uh, Webpack is you'll configure a series of loaders, which basically say, okay, someone imported a CSS file, which I'll talk about in just a second, but someone wants the CSS file to be part of the bundle. Uh, I know of a loader that can take that CSS and format it, format it in a way that it can be placed in my bundle, in my JavaScript file, but then loaded into the browser as a CSS resource for it to understand the styles. So this is all about packing things down, right? I don't wanna have 15 requests for JavaScript files and two more requests for CSS files and 13 requests for HTML templates that I have out there. Webpack can put it all together. What's the thing that worries me about Webpack sometimes? Well, it's not standard. Like, we have this beautiful world of web standards where we've defined the syntax for import and export, we've defined the syntax for XML, HTTP request, and fetch, and all these other things, but yet we still need this tool that um, just you know, comes with its own way of doing things and it allows you to write code like this. So this is an Angular 2 component. This Angular 2 component requires an HTML template, which I could define the template inline, or I could just define it without this require and just say it's app.component.html. 
Would that one mean at runtime, there's an extra network request to go out and fetch this template? Well, if I'm using Webpack, I can actually write a require statement here. And for those that use common JS modules in the past with Node.js, you'll know that require is like an import. It's a way of saying, hey, I require this HTML file. And Webpack has the right sort of plugins available where Webpack will recognize that statement and say, oh, let me go out to the file system, read that HTML, and, and just place it into the JavaScript so that everything's in line, right? I don't have to do an extra fetch. And what, just, so just what worries me is when an entire application starts depending on that, it's not standard. I wish we could be, I wish, uh, <laughs> I hope my grandkids, I hope the web programming is better when my grandkids are, are doing programming, that's all. I hope we've figured it all out <laughs> or moved on, I don't know. And the other thing that people struggle with is if I'm a library or framework author and I need, I want to write one of these new um, libraries or utilities that's going to be using ECMAScript 2015 and I'm going to be putting it with import and export statements, um, should I pre-compile things for you? And if I do, should I compile them into common JS format? Or uh, maybe you're not going to be using Webpack, I don't know. So do I need to compile it into the universal module definition, which adds a lot of prefix or, uh, prefix code to every JavaScript function. What about polyfill? So I'm writing a utility that's going to depend on a native promise implementation or a promise implementation being available in the browser. Do I add that polyfill or do, do I just tell, tell you in the documentation that you have to have a promise available? There's all sorts of questions that are still being um, hashed out and there's no perfect way to solve these problems in this world that we have right now, but maybe someday. And that's where I just get sort of um, frustrated. Uh, the tooling in this area is like living on the sea. <laughs> Sometimes it's very exciting and you're in the boat and you're thinking, this is great. I'm, on the, I'm in a wave and I'm still living. But then there's days where you get very close to that inner circle there and you just want to walk out of the office and give up. And <laughs> it's been an, a lot better, I will say this. <clears throat> it's been a lot better over the last six months than it was throughout 2014 and 2015 and most of 2016, things have settled down just a bit. And I think uh, that's all I have for you. So maybe you could grab lunch a little bit early, but if you have any questions about this, I'll stick around. That's my email address. If you have any questions too, you can email me. Um, I can point you to an entire repository of GitHub, of code on GitHub that's not well organized, but it has a lot of uh, the little examples that I use to figure out or just document how some of these things work and how some of these things don't work. Um, and if you really want to look at that, just send me an email and I'll send it off. But thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>